Good morning, everyone. Shabbat Shalom and welcome. A couple quick announcements. Quick announcement. The discussion has started already about Sukkot. Can you believe it? That uh, That's where we're looking forward to this already. Uh, I think it's late September this year, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't checked the calendar, but from what I remember last year. But we are believing that the borders will be open. We are believing that we'll be able to gather, and we are believing that uh, you know the campsites will be up and functioning. Right now, over here in Canada, everything is still shut down, or Ontario anyway. So, but we're believing for all that, and it'll be nice to get everybody together again and be able to celebrate that once again. So we are making plans for that, and uh, if we end up like we did last year, we end up like we did last year. If we end up uh, being able to do it, hey, fantastic. I look forward to it. I look forward to hugging a lot of necks that I haven't seen in a long time as we've been trapped, I guess you can almost call it. So let's go to prayer and start this off. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Father, for the things that you're doing within our walk, within our lives, and how you're bringing your people forth and how you're revealing yourself and what you have set in your scripture, Father, for the end times, Father. We're grateful for it and we will fulfill that in which you have placed within our lives, each and every one of us. And right now we take authority of every spirit of darkness and we bind you in Yeshua's name and what I bind on this earth is bound in heaven itself. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. As we get launched today, I need a volunteer. <laughs> You're not going to be able to stand on that chair, Yoshi. Here, let me help you stand up here. There, now we turn around and say hi to everybody. <laughs> oh, I'll hang on to you so you don't fall, okay? You want to hang on to me? You're fine? I just don't want you to wipe out. Okay, I'm going to start off with a little riddle. I don't expect you to get the first part of this, okay? The first part's for the adults, but the second part, they're not going to get it either, though. But the second part's for you. What lives in a group brings individual judgment as well as collective judgment has an extremely strict hierarchy, very defined roles and responsibilities. Some gather and collect for the betterment of the group, while others stay to take care of the home or the abode. They're extremely busy all the time, but they're not busy about nothing or their own interests. Now that he's already per per perplexed, so now it comes over to you, mister. What can fly? but it's not a helicopter or a plane. Can you read? <laughs> Don't be looking at the answers. <laughs> what can fly, but it's not a helicopter or a plane? There's one clue. Okay, you want another one? It's an insect, but it's not a flying ant. Want another one? It's yellow and black. Any guesses yet? It flies, it's yellow and black. A bee. A bee. You didn't even need all the hints. You want the rest of the hints first? We should have rehearsed this. I can sting, but I'm not a wasp. It lives in a hive and cannot be found near honey, but it's not Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> you got it, man. Bee. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Give my <a> hand. <laughs> And that's what we're going to be talking about today, is bees. Because when you go through all of that within the, the, the colony of a bee hive, at the end of it, what happens is somebody comes along, this is the point of the whole thing, somebody comes along and takes everything that you've worked for. A bee. You see, it's been probably 33, 34 years now, I worked for a beekeeper while I was in high school for uh, six years. I wasn't in high school for six years. It went to after I was. <laughs> Best nine years of my life. <laughs> you know, it's been a long time, but th there are some things you don't forget in life when you make a mistake out there working with the bees and you get stung. When that, when that pain comes, there are certain things you just don't do again. And I'm going to explain today a little bit of corporate honey production. 
you know, all the stuff, and it was a corporation that I worked for, uh, all the stuff that went into Heinz and everybody's had the Heinz honey barbecue sauce and all that stuff, that came from where I worked during high school. And I went out and I worked with the bees, we extracted the honey, we brought it back in, used the machines, all that, brought them back out, went through the whole process. I, I know a lot about it. It's just a fact of what I went through. That's, this is just my experience. Now, if you have an experience, you know, in life, I use uh, cooking for an example. If I'm making a, a lasagna, which I'm gonna get my lasagna yet, yet Miss Tony, but if I'm making a lasagna, which I've never made yet, and somebody's watching me and they see me, you know, pull out sugar, and they see me pull out peanut butter and other, they're gonna say, what's wrong with you? And when I look at scripture and I see bees, I see honey, I see it through different eyes because of the experience that I had doing that. So let's start off today in Judges 14.6. Judges 14.6. And here we're going to talk about Samson. Samson killing the lion. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. And before he tore the lion apart, as one tears apart a young goat, and he had nothing at all in his hand, but he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. So when he went down and walked and talked with the woman, and she looked pleasing to Samson. When he returned later to, to take her, he turned aside to see the carcass of a lion, the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and a honey were in the body of the lion. So he scraped the honey out of it with his hands, and he went on, eating as he went. And when he came to his father and mother, he gave them some, and they ate it. But they, he didn't tell them that he had taken the, money, the, the honey from the body of a lion. His father went down to the woman, and Samson prepared a feast there. That was for the customary thing to, for young men to do. Was, he was getting married. When the people saw him, they brought 30 companions with him. Then Samson said to them, let me ask you a riddle. And this is why I kind of started off having a little bit of fun this morning with a riddle. Let me ask you a riddle. If you can tell me what is within the seven days of the feast, the wedding feast that he was having, and solve it, then I will give you 30 linen tunics, which are the undergarments, and 30 changes of outer clothing. But if you are unable to tell me the answer, then you shall give me 30 tunics, undergarments, and 30 changes of outer clothing. And they said unto him, Go ahead, ask your riddle, so that we may hear it. So he said to them, Out of the eater, this is the point here, Out of the eater came something to eat. And out of the strong came something sweet, and they could not solve the riddle in three days. Now, working for a beekeeper and being a beekeeper for that many years, I know it was a long time ago, but at the same time, there's certain things you just don't forget in life. That's not characteristics of bees. One, bees avoid death. They avoid carcasses, and bees do not swarm and make hives close to the ground. Now, I'll explain a little bit about swarming. When a bee, bee swarm, usually it's to expand, and that bee takes off, and the queen bee takes off, and they all go with the queen bee, but they usually generally go up high. Now, we had to go, and we'd have to put a, a hive on top of a ladder, try and get it as close as we can. Sometimes we'd have to cut the branch down to get it back in the hive, and we're not talking like a few hives. We had like 1,500 hives spread all over, the, all over Ontario. And we'd have to get that queen and try and coax them back in there into that hive. But they always went up high. They always went up where it's safe, always away from predators. So to hear this, and immediately it just triggers in my head, what the heck is going on here? This is so uncharacteristic of, of, of honeybees to be able to do this. Now, honeybees aren't what you get when you're having a picnic and you're eating your hamburgers and hot dogs and you get those little red and, or yellow and black uh, wasp that come around and that's what they are. They're called yellow jackets. Those are not honeybees. Those are wasps. Honeybees look different and they act completely different. But they do not come around and they do not try to sting people on purpose and they do not make their hives on the ground if they don't have to. There's predators there that they try to protect and get away from that stuff. Judges 14, 15. Let's continue on. Then on the fourth day they said to Samson's wife, Persuade your husband to tell us, through you, the answer to the riddle, or we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us to make us poor? Is this not true? 
So Samson's wife wept before him and said, you, you only hate me for you don't love me. For you have asked my countrymen a riddle and they have not told me the, the answer to them. And he said to her, listen, I've not told my father and mother either, so why would I tell you? However, Samson's wife wept before him for seven days while their, fest, uh, their wedding feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him so hard, she whimpered so loud, she was just, oh, and he wanted to make his wife feel better, I guess. Then she told the answer of the riddle to her countrymen. You see again, the seventh day, the seventh day of his wedding feast, completeness. Does that have anything to do with it? Not really, I'm just explaining what was going on here. 14, 18, so the men of the city said to Samson on the seventh day before sundown, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Then the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 men and took their gear, gave changes of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. And his anger burned and he went up to his father's house. Down to Judges 15, 20, just to wrap this one up. And Samson ended up judging Israel in the days of the occupation of the Philistines for 20 years. So what's up with the bees and the lion? What's up with the bees and the lion? What is the parallel with the bees and the lion? Because it doesn't make sense. Those bees were not just there because they, that's not what bees do. Those bees were there for a very specific reason. And here's the reason. You know, you get the carcass of that young, young lion, the lion of Judah. And then you get the tribe of Dan, typified by, the, by bees. That's one of Dan's sign, signs. And what the bees produce in the end time is the golden age symbolized by the honey. Now let's look at the lion's identity a little bit here. And I'm going to give you a quick verse there, and then I'm really going to focus in on the identity of the bee. Revelation 5.5. 5. Then one of the 20... Just one verse there. You don't have to flip there if you don't want to. Then one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look closely. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome and conquered. He can open the scroll and break its seven seals. You see, that lion, that lion and his riddle represents Judah. And this is what I was talking about last week when I paused and I really wanted to get into some of this stuff and it was like, no, move forward. So let's look into the, the identity of the bee. Now, when you get into the identity of the, of the bee here, there's a little bit of history that's involved with this. And there's a little bit of tying, well, there's a lot of tying things together in order to come up with the fact that that is referring back over to Dan. You see, when you get into some of the kings of Dan, they used to have bees that were buried with them. They had golden bees that were buried with them. And I'm not going to give the, get into all the detail because I don't want to give away who the Antichrist is here. But there's 300 golden bees were discovered on a lot of these kings. And these bees are regarded as a symbol, as a symbol of the tribe of Dan. And that goes right back to what we were talking about with Samson's riddle. Now you look at somebody like Napoleon. We all know who Napoleon was. We talked about Napoleon probably five or six weeks ago a little bit as we were going through the time of Jacob's trouble. And this is an extension off of that. I'm not teaching. Well, I guess I'm kind of in, 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 am teaching into it. But I didn't want to interrupt that. But when Napoleon was crowned himself, he had 300 bees embroidered into his gear, his garb. And at the same time when he got married... He insisted, he demanded that his wife have those 300 bees put in her wedding dress as well, embedded into it. You see, what it comes down to when you look at bees, bees do not produce for the beekeeper. Bees do not produce for me and you for the honey. Bees produce for themselves. Bees produce for the betterment of the group. Bees produce for their own survival and the survival of their tribe. And these are, we're talking about here, these are the bees of the end times. You know, bees produce honey. We know that. Not all bees produce honey. 
a lot of things, again, that you see, there are wasps, there's carpenter bees, there's other bees out there that don't produce honey. We eat honey from a honey bee. It's very specific. Now, if you've ever been around them, they're the ones that'll sting, and they sting one time only. They've got one sting, they push out their abdomen, and they will die doing what they do. They last 24 hours after they do that. And once they're, they do that, one sting, their life is expired. It's done. But they do it for the better of the colony. Now let's go back over to Genesis 10, verse 8, talking about the golden age. Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech, and Akkad, and Cana, in the land of Shinar, in Babylonia. Genesis 11, verse 9. I'm going to do a lot of jumping around here. Genesis 11, verse 9. Therefore the name of this city was Babel, because there, are, there the Lord confused the language of the entire earth, and from that place the Lord scattered and dispersed them over the face of the earth. Now we did a lot of talking lately, doing Jacob's trouble about Babylon, and the Babylonian Empire. We talked a lot about the Golden Age. We went through all this stuff already. So if you have to go back and review that, go back and review it. I know there's a lot to take in. You probably have to listen to it three or four times. Jeremiah 51, 7. I've got one verse here. One verse here. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that had made all the earth drunken in the nations, have drunk her wine. Therefore, the nations are bad. You see, that of Babylon, that and what was going on back in Babylon's day, that spread to the other nations and it's still going on. But every nation that they had conquered, they brought in what they were doing. They brought their sin into that nation. And that nation began doing that sin and just kind of eased back and relaxed. And then they, everybody just kind of went along with the flow and everything was okay. Except in God's eyes. And that's what's happened to our society, in your society, wherever you're at around the world. Things have just gotten watered down where, oh, it, it's okay. No, it's not. It's not okay in the Father's eyes. Because we can see Babylon back then. We can see back there with Nimrod and the Tower of Babel. We can see Babylon in the very end time. And I'm going to read off about six scriptures here in Revelation about Babylon. They're in order. So Revelation 14, verse 8. Then the other angel... A second one followed, saying, Fallen is Babylon, the great. She who has made all nations drink the wine of the passions of her immorality, corrupting them with idolatry. Idolatry. This is such a big one right now with what we're talking about. Idolatry. Revelation 16, verse 9. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God kept in mind Babylon the Great to give her the cup of wine of his fierce and furious wrath. 17.5 of Revelation. And on her, fore on her forehead, a name was written. A mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, false religions, heresies, and all of the abominations of the earth. What are the abominations of the earth? The things that are going on in the earth that are against God's will, against God's word, against God's commandments. Those are the things that are what? Abominations. And he shouted with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen, Revelation 18, 2. And he shouted with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen, certainly to be destroyed is Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a dungeon hunted by every unclean spirit and a prison for every unclean and loathsome bird. Revelation 18.10 Standing a long way off, in fear of her torment, saying, Woe, the great city, the strong city of Babylon, is a single hour your judgment has come. Twenty-one of Revelation 18.21 Then a single powerful angel picked up the boulder like a great millstone and flung it to the sea with such a voice, will Babylon the great city be hurled down by the sudden spectacular judgment of God and will never again be found. Revelation 18, 24, last one. And in Babylon was found the blood of the prophets 
and of the saints, all of those who have been, get, been slaughtered on the earth. You see, everywhere in Scripture, Babylon has always been associated with gold and that golden dynasty and the golden age. You can see a golden age then only to be a shadow of things to come with the golden age to come. You see, the one we see now, the Babylon we see now, even now, it's a beautiful place. It's referred to as the hanging gardens of Babylon because it's of its beauty. And that's why even now it's, it deserves to be recognized by gold. And it's still going on. But what's going to happen to that gold? Well, we kind of went through that already, but we'll go through it a little bit more, and I'm not going to be done with this topic. I know that. So where does all this stuff come from? How does Dan play into all of this stuff? How does that come into play? How did Dan get to that place? How was Dan found at the tribes at the beginning, and how was Dan not found in the tribes in the end? You can see, and you can go back and compare the two lists. Let's start back off in Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24.10. Now the sons of, the, of an Israelite woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the Israelites. And he and a man of Israel quarreled and struggled with each other in the camp. The Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. So they brought him to Moses. Now his mother's name was Shemath, the daughter of Dibri, son, or Dib, Dibri of the tribe of Dan. What are we talking about here? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. They put him in custody until the will and the command of the Lord might be made clear to him. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the one who has cursed the Lord outside the camp and let all who heard, heard him lay their hands on his head as a witness of guilt. Then all the congregation stoned him. You shall speak to the Israelites, saying, Whoever curses his God will bear his sin. Further, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall most certainly be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The stranger, as well as the native-born, shall be put to death when he blasphemes the name of the Lord. Again, from the tribe of Dan. Why Dan? Why Dan in all this? How was Dan associated? Dan was associated because Dan constantly was associated with introducing idol worship over and over within Scripture. It was of the tribe of Dan who first came under this curse. They were the first ones to come under the curse. What curse are we talking about? Deuteronomy 29, 18. I know it's after that, but it's still related to it. Deuteronomy 20, 19. If there's such a person, when he hears the words of this curse, he will bless himself himself secretly saying, saying to himself, I'll be all right, even though I'll stubbornly keep doing whatever I feel like doing, so that I, although dry, will be added to the water. Talking about what? Dry, being sinful, will be added to the water, which is what? The righteous. But Adonai will not forgive him. Rather, the, the, rather, the anger and jealousy of Adonai will blaze up against that person. Every curse written in this book will be upon him. Adonai will blot out his name from under heaven. Adonai will single him out from all the tribes of Israel to experience what is bad in all the curses of the covenant written in this book. Well, the covenant, we're supposed to keep that covenant? Well, we went through that even on Wednesday. We went through that. And just again, the covenant is spoke of. In the beginning, the covenant is spoke of all the way through Scripture right up to the very end. I just can't figure out how the church can't figure it out. Maybe they can't read. He can. Deuteronomy 29, 21. When the next generation, your children, who will grow up after you, and foreigner who arrives from a distant land, will see the plagues of the land with the disease in which Adonai has made it sick. So again, they're what? Sick. But what are we talking about here? It's all about idol worship. It's all about idol worship. Let's go back to Judges 18.29. Talk about Dan a little bit more here. Judges 18.29. The name of the city, Dan. After Dan, their forefather, who was born to Israel. Who's what? Jacob. However, the original name of the city was Lash. The tribe of the sons of Dan set up the image of silver-plated wood for themselves. 
Again, constantly going back to idol worship. Always going back to idol worship. And Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses, and his son, sons were, were priests of the tribe to the Danites until the day of the captivity and exile from the land. So they set up for themselves Mike, Micah's silver-plated wooden image which he had made and kept it throughout the time that the house of the tabernacle of God was in Shiloh. Now let's pull some of that forward. Let's pull some of that forward. And let's look at David. I've got to work my David in here. Now we look at David and we look, okay, he wrote a lot of the Psalms and stuff like that. And that was old stuff. Whoa, 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 time out. Time out here. David was a prophet, first of all. David had some stuff going on that was end time stuff. So let's look and see how these bees are related to what David was going through. And let's look to the future instead of looking to the past with it and see how it br and bring this forward. In Psalms 118, verse 12. 118, ver verse 12. They swarmed around me like bees. What's he talking about here? Think of the bees as people. Chaos. Blasphemous. They flare up and are extinguished like, like a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. So he's obviously not just talking about bees here. They swarm around me like bees. He's talking about enemies here. They flare up, they're extinguished, they have fi fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. Now let's look at somebody else here. Samson. Samson himself, he had a weapon. Samson, what was Samson's weapon? He was strong. Extremely strong. He had a God-given strength. Let's look at David. What did David have for a weapon? David also had a weapon. He took on Goliath. What did he do there? We were talking about it this week. I was talking with one of the brothers. You know, he probably sat there as a shepherd boy, probably bored of sitting out there in the field, and probably knew exactly what he was doing with that sling. I'm sure he did. But you also see David as well. We'll get into this probably next week. David himself killed a lion. Do you think that it just happens to mention that in Scripture, that he killed a lion and a bear? God doesn't do anything by coincidence. He took those things on. He defeated them the way that he needed to defeat them. And guess what we have as a weapon? Guess what we have as a weapon? You got your finger. Does it not say in Scripture, hey, I'll point my, my finger, and they're going to fall, how many at your right side, how many at your left side? All in what? In the name of the Lord? This is what David was going through. Back to Psalm uh, 118.5. I wanted to bring that verse, and now we're going to pull it all the way through. We're going to go 5 to 15. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can, what can a mere man do to me? Listen, bring this forward. Look at this through end time eyes now. The Lord is on my side. He is among those who help me. Therefore, I will look and triumph those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations encompassed me in the name of the Lord. I will surely cut them off. They encompassed me. Yes, they surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, I will cut them off. They swarmed around me, they flare up, and they're extinguished like fires of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You, my enemy, Psalm 118, 118 13. You, my enemy, pushed me violently so that I was falling. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. Do we not keep talking about the song that's written in Revelation? The song of Moses that was sang there? The song that was going on that, that we will sing again? In Revelation, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. Ephraim and Judah. Ephraim and Judah. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Now let's look at another aspect of that. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of that, but you can see through there, David looking I can see him looking and seeing end-time stuff. 
with what he was going, on, going through. Again, a shadow of things to come. Great destruction is going to come to the face of the earth, but we can go back to this stuff and say, hey, if he made it through that, we can make it through that too. He had weapons, Samson had weapons, and God has armed his people with weapons. He's given us spiritual weapons to defeat these things that are coming to the face of the earth. The trials, the tribulations, the Nephilim, demonic forces, all abominations. Everything's going to get poured out in the final fight here, people, and we're going to have to be, uh, he keeps saying it, it sounds boring, lined up with the Word of God. But you need to be lined up with the Word of God because if you're lined up with the Word of God, you're in line to get your bullets to be able to fight the fight. Those are your weapons. Now let's look at somebody else that deals with honey. We're going to talk about John the Baptist here for a second. Locust and wild honey. Where else and who else in Scripture does it explain what they were eating when they came, came around? You think God just, oops, we're just going to... God doesn't miss a beat. He purposed somebody's heart to make sure that that got penned down there. Matthew 3.3 3. This is he who was mentioned by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, shouting in the desert, Prepare the road for the Lord. Make his highway straight, level and direct. His name is... This same John's garments were made of camel's hair. And he wore leather leather girdle about his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. There's nothing there that's... Everything there has a meaning. The camel's hair has a meaning. The leather girdle has a meaning. The locust has a meaning. The wild honey has a meaning. Everything has a meaning of why they described what was going on with him. You see, but what he was doing here, he was preparing, and he was the, the guy who came to prepare the way, to pave the way for the Savior to come. You see, what we are doing is we are preparing a people for the coming Savior who is going to destroy, destroy the recreated golden age, or the attempted golden age. Again, going back to what we did on the time of Jacob's trouble. You see, because what darkness wants to do, he wants to set up his Babylon in parallel with a land that we have flowing with milk and honey, and he's going to just try and disguise it. And that's where we've got to be aware. Because that was promised to our people, or God's people. A land flowing with milk and honey. And we will have that land flowing with milk and honey one day. But let me tell you something. It's not Babylon. Don't get spoofed by the Babylon. And the beauty of Babylon, it has nothing to do with the beauty that God's going to bring to his people. Let's jump back to what I talked about a few weeks ago. The plague, the eighth plague, locust. Exodus 10, verse 4 and 5. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. And they will also eat the rest of what has escaped, what is left to you from the hail. And they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. Now let's jump to the Revelation, the parallel in Revelation, and that's Revelation 9, 3 and 4. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given to them as the scorpions of the earth have power. Again, when you start talking about these locusts that God brought, the plagues that God brought back then, God was taking on their gods, and God was using the things that they worshipped, the things that they worshipped, idol worship, and using it and weaponizing it against them to show them that he defeated their God. And you look in the only pl other place that that's talked about and that's used. You talk about uh, with what it says there about John the Baptist. The only other time that that word is akris in Greek, the only other time it's used is in Revelation. Two times in Scripture. You know, we're going to get into over the next few weeks, I'm going to start talking a few, about, you know, okay, Moses crossed the Red Sea. What was he eating? Unleavened bread. You remember Jesus when he fed the 5,000 people? There's a great story with that. There's a whole parallel. But there's one part of that that's never been talked about. He climbed into the boat, and then he climbed back out of the boat. He crossed over, back to thresholds. You see, bees make honey. 
Honey is the golden age. Bees are Dan's symbol and into the golden age. The golden age is Babylon and all because what? Dan worshipped other gods. And in Daniel 2.45, it says God or Christ is going to come and Christ is going to break it into, the, into pieces. From the carcass of the young lion, which is Judah, the tribe of Dan, the bees, will attempt to produce a golden age. Christ will come and Christ will destroy their golden age. Revelation 10.9, So I went up to the angel and told him, to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it. Eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. Last scripture as we wrap up, Revelation 10.10. 10. So I took the little book from the angel's hand and ate it. And in my mouth it was as sweet as honey, but once I had swallowed it, my stomach was bitter. People, all the way through Scripture, all the way through Scripture, it's always been going back to idol worship, to idol worship. And God said, what? Don't have any other idols before me. Don't bow down to anything else. He went through all of that. Let me tell you something, Ephraim. Let me tell you something, church. The church is not much different right now than Dan. There is a lot of idol, idol worship going on that still has to come out. The only difference between Dan and us is repentance. That's the difference. They will not repent. And not every, I'm not saying they all won't repent. There will be some in there that do. Hopefully most do. But there will be a lot that do not repent. Because it all goes back to the curses of blasphemy that we talked about in Deuteronomy 29. All the way back to where Dan introduced it in Leviticus. Blasphemy. 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 What's the one thing, the unpardonable sin? Blasphemy. Blaspheme in the Holy Ghost. There's many different forms of blasphemy, but blaspheming the Holy Ghost, blaspheming our God above. Unpardonable. The only other thing that you can't come back from is a reprobate mind. But again, those are choices. Now, you don't have to worry about, you know, people have been concerned, oh, did I blaspheme? If you blasphemed, your heart would be turned ice cold. You would be hard as coal, black as coal. You know, there's always time for repentance. You look at people who have been into witchcraft and all the other stuff that have gotten delivered and become Christians and are serving God. There's something real special about when you have to get down right down to blaspheming God to the point where that happens. But we see that it's going to happen. It's already happened in Scripture. And we know that we're going to have all that blasphemous stuff in the end from the Antichrist. This whole thing is going to lead us, and we're going to go down this journey a little way. I don't know how far we're going to go. But there's a great deal of information that's coming out of the Scriptures. It's for us. It's for now. It's for the end times. And we're putting it all together. Why? So that you can be aware. Put your astute hats on. I don't know how you do that. But you got to be astute to what's going on out here in this world. you got to be astute to the tactics of darkness. Do not get shanghai Do not get tricked. Do not be deceived. Because there's a great deception out there. Darkness never reveals. He doesn't usually knock on the front door because you'd recognize him right away. What's he do? He tries to sneak in the back door. That's how he gets you off track. Do not allow it to happen. Take the heed, take the warning. But this stuff is real. We really are in the end times. I'm not trying to convince you, but I'm trying to push it. You know that we're in the end time. But there's things that are coming out now. There's things that are coming out now, and there's more that's going to be coming out. Because it's so important that we know that we know that we know. The information, at the same time, we've got to know that we know that we know how to fight. And the fight is done in the Spirit. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come before you and we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for your depth. And Father, we thank you for what you put these other guys through in Scripture so that they can be an example for us and an example, Father, so that we can look and bring it forward, Father, as to who you are. 
what you're doing and how you're going to affect our lives. Protect us, guide us, guard us, and give us a boldness within our attitude, within our walk, Father. In Yeshua's name we pray. We ask you to comfort these people, Father, throughout the week. In Yeshua's name, amen.